everyone, Lynn Swanson here from givesmiles.us. If you've watched our video, Why Does My Dog Do That?, you know we're a not-for-profit shelter project with the mission of helping dog lovers go well beyond loving their dogs to truly understand canine culture and communication. Why Does My Dog Do That? is the first of our videos, and it's one that you should watch before this one to put a few things into perspective. So if you've watched it, excellent. If not, turn this one off and go find Why Does My Dog Do That? on YouTube. Twelve common mistakes people make with their dogs and how easy it is to avoid them. So in Why Does My Dog Do That? I discuss a number of good questions to ask. They are, has he been rewarded for doing it in the past? Could a negative association be a factor? Have you failed to show him better behaviors so he doesn't consider them as options? Could he be following a routine that needs changing? Is he looking for an outlet for his pent-up energy? Or could the reason be instinctual? After all, he is a dog. The last question to ask is this one. Are you setting your dog up for failure without realizing it? Since people often do this, despite the best of intentions, we felt it's a topic worthy of a video all its own. This video covers 12 common mistakes, together with some hints to help you turn things around. Common mistake number one, expecting the best from an under-exercised dog. Whenever we take a new dog into our facility, this is the policy we follow. Before we expect him to meet our needs, our need for him to focus and to follow our lead, our need for him to behave well in a new setting, and our desire for him to excel at any task, we need to meet a few of his needs first. This includes his need to feel clean his need to feel safe, his need to eliminate, and any dog's preference for a relaxed state of mind. And for any dog to feel relaxed, his need to move in a manner appropriate for his age and breed type must be satisfied. With adolescents and any member of a working, herding, terrier, or sporting breed, I affectionately call this his need for a little speed. Why is that? Because dogs aren't couch potatoes by design. Even the little ones need to move every day to remain physically and psychologically fit. They also need to use their canine brains to show you what they're capable of. Dogs need to feel accomplished. Bella and Ladybug need to chase a balled-up piece of paper every once in a while, just to show everyone what they could do. For Howie, it takes a few directed jogs up and down the driveway followed by the finding and retrieving of a half-dozen hidden-around-the-house balls to satisfy his need to move and demonstrate his capabilities. Don't let the petite size of Lucy the Lhasa fool you. This pint-sized Spitfire is prone to bouts of barking and anxiety if her need for speed isn't satisfied by 20 minutes of walking on a treadmill, followed by a long side-by-side -side directed walk around the block, twice a day, nearly every day. Why do I say side by side? Because partnering up next to her person, with her person directing speed, route, and pauses along the way in a relaxed manner, works her little canine brain as much as her body, whereas Lucy dragging her person around the neighborhood like a boat anchor wouldn't. Sweet Alexis lives for her morning jog with the next door neighbor, as much as she does slow walks tied to the side of her elderly owner's three wheel trike, three days a week. If dogs were horses, Jojo the Pity would be a quarter horse, super fast for a quarter mile before petering out, while Nico the Doberman would be a thoroughbred, just warming up for the first mile and looking forward to the second and the third. When it comes to fulfilling your dog's needs so he can better fulfill your own behaviorally, you'll find that three things are pretty important. First, always look for ways to exercise his brain as much as his body. Second, the more you learn about what his DNA really yearns to do, and the more you let him express it in productive ways, the more you will be working with as opposed to against the best of his nature. And third, it always helps to time your exercise in the morning when you can. 
A well-exercised dog is less likely to turn over the trash cans. He's less likely to tear up his pillow. And he's less likely to fight with his dog buddies. Rather, he is set up to be relaxed the rest of the day. While it helps to be a strong, youthful jogger, if you have a strong, youthful dog, even less able dog owners can use certain tools to fulfill their dog's need to move every day. Faced with bouncy, under-exercised dogs of my favorite breed, Dobermans, I often reach for my three-wheel trike. A friend who likes to jog or inline skate, or with dogs who enjoy and know how to use this tool, a treadmill. A few words about treadmilling, though, if the idea of doing it intrigues you. First, please know that it is absolutely vital to introduce this tool to your dog correctly. Second, understand that one way doesn't work with every dog. The approach we take with the slow walkers is different than the one we take with the speed demons, and the approach we take with confident dogs is very different than the one we take with less secure ones. And third, you have one and only one time to introduce a treadmill to a dog the first time, and if you scare them or confuse them, you'll create a negative association that can last a lifetime. Treadmilling done right can be lots of fun, but treadmilling is never fun. Chapter 17 of this book, Smile and Other Practical Life Lessons Your Dogs Can Teach You While You Are Training Them, which can be found here, discusses the difference between fun, productive treadmilling and really don't do it treadmilling. Chapter 5, which discusses canine savvy household routines designed to meet your needs while meeting the needs of your dogs, will also be quite helpful. Going back to the topic of fine tuning good exercise to a particular dog, Direct retrievers to retrieve things well beyond the occasional tennis ball, both inside the house and outside. These dogs love to do this, and they love seeing your enjoyment of them doing it in productive ways. With herding dogs and certain terriers, I'm a huge fan of playing tri ball in the backyard. If you don't know what tri ball is, notice how it's spelled so you can look it up later online. When all is said and done, a dog who is well exercised is one who is ready to work on good lessons like healing, go out, and come back, and he's ready to practice commands like sits, downs, and stays. Speaking of sits, downs, and stays, common mistake number two is expecting dogs to respond to commands that require an element of calm, like sit, down, or stay, when they are highly excited. Ever see dogs that sit on command only to jump up quickly? Chances are they associate the word sit with excitement because their handlers have made this mistake time and time again. If your dog is excited, help him to drop his heightened energy first by using a little directed movement. Encourage him to follow you for 6 to 10 feet with a few claps of your hand and movement of your body to get his attention. Then give him the command to sit, down, or stay once he has focused and followed you. You'll notice that he's a lot more likely to do what you want and do a better job of it. Where your dog's focus is, is important. Common mistake number three is expecting dogs to respond to your direction when their focus isn't on you. Doing this isn't setting either of you up for success. It's actually setting you both up to fail. Focus is one of the many good reasons why all of my dogs work for well-timed, genuine smiles. Consider this. When you reward your dog with a treat, where, if he hasn't been trained otherwise, is his focus? The treat, of course. And what is happening with his energy level? It's a bit higher, isn't it? But when he is rewarded with a genuine, I am so proud of you smile, the kind that lights up your face and goes up to your eyes, Where is his focus? It's on your face, even when you have a treat in your hand. And what happens with his energy level? It drops, doesn't it? I mention this in all of my videos, and it's worth repeating for several good reasons, not the least of which is dogs love genuine, relaxed smiles, the kind that tells them that you're happy. Grimaces don't count. These kind of smiles aren't just good for our dogs, they're equally good for us. They drop our blood pressure, something you may not know is happening, but your dogs do. They increase our happy endorphin levels, something else that our dogs recognize. And they relax our muscles. They also connect us better as a team. Here's Hiker, 
my canine partner, ignoring the hubbub of the Los Angeles airport while waiting for me to return with my coffee. Here he is in downtown San Diego. Notice a fire truck in the distance? The sirens of a three-alarm fire don't hold a lot of his attention because his focus is solely on me. And here he is at a Humane Society conference. As my Vertigo assistant service dog, Hiker travels up and down escalators routinely. When it came to teaching him how to do this, it was one of the easiest things in the world. Why? Consider what all the people traveling in the opposite direction do when they see him. They smile, of course, and Hiker loves working for smiles. Dogs like to be around happy, relaxed people. On to common mistake number four. Introducing dogs to each other face-to-face on tense leashes without walking them side-by-side for five minutes first, so you can then introduce them on relaxed leashes. I've got a video that details a much better way to introduce dogs of all ages, shapes, sizes, and energy levels to each other and to other people, objects, and animals. It's an excellent video to view next. For now, let this be your take-home message. Dogs move away from tension. Ever notice how dogs tend to pull back when you pull them forward? It's a reflex. They're not even thinking about it. Ever notice how dogs tend to pull forward when you pull back? It's due to the same reflex. And if a dog is at a higher level of energy or in an unsettled state of mind like this fellow, watch out. Your leash's tension, and definitely your own, has just sent him over the edge. Tension is also why your dog pulls so much when you attach an extendable leash to him. An extendable leash is constant tension, plus the inflexibility of its bulky plastic handle, totally gets in the way of any communication you could be having with him. He feels a constant pull, and in response, he pulls back. The best way to fix this issue? Leave your extendable leashes in your closet for the occasional trip to a leash pet only beach, and use a soft cloth leash, three quarters inch wide and four foot long instead. Then communicate with your dog using the movement of your hands and body more, and your leash much less. Smile, the book I mentioned earlier, will also help you in this regard. Common mistake number five is reaching out toward or over dogs that you don't know. My recommendation? Keep your posture upright. In a relaxed manner, turn 120 to 180 degrees to better face the direction the dog is facing. Invite him to your side with a comfortable step or two forward. Squat down with small dogs and puppies. And don't forget to smile to drop your blood pressure and increase your happy endorphins. This gives dogs time for a polite sniff, and it invites them to approach if they want, as opposed to be approached by you, whether they like it or not. If you're saying, but that's not the way humans introduce themselves to each other, you're right. The thing is, Dogs aren't little humans, and as much as they enjoy living with us, it's just not in their nature to follow the social rules of our species. Consider how two members of our culture greet each other. Do we sniff each other's butts? Of course not! We look into each other's eyes, we reach for each other, and we're vocal. Hi, how are you? I'm Lynn. But in canine culture, if two individuals just meeting each other for the first time look each other in the eye, And if they are vocal and if they reach out, they could be offering a challenge. Not good. Polite dogs lead with low noses and not with their eyes, their ears, or their limbs. Their noses seek out each other's back half before exploring a lot of each other's front half. This is instinctual. It is canine culture, and dogs are programmed to do this from birth. So instead of doing this, simply do this. Same lovely person pictured here. Same sweet little dog named Maggie. If a picture or two says a thousand words, I think these two pictures say it all. And Maggie's being quite honest about how she feels. Yes, I know some people are still teaching this approach to new dogs. Think shaking hands as opposed to polite side sniffing. But for the sake of dogs everywhere, please consider introducing yourself to them in a more canine intuitive manner. Your change in orientation so as not to face them head-on, together with your relaxed movement, will put a lot more of them at ease than you reaching a hand tentatively toward their heads. It will also keep you safer. Does your dog bark at visitors to your home? 
The same kind of across from a dog posture and positioning, hesitant energy, and lack of movement are to blame. The book I mentioned goes into this topic in detail, and it offers several easy workarounds that solve the issue. All tension-free alternatives that leave you and your dog happy, and your friends safe and feeling welcomed. Since you're first and foremost human, I know you want to ask, when is it okay to reach out and pet a new dog? Although the answer is going to differ between individuals, here are a few clear ways that dogs invite people to take the next step. Some will turn their head away and then turn back in your direction. Some will nudge your hand, inviting you to give them a gentle massage. And others will walk a few steps away before returning. In this way, a dog's walking away signals his comfort with your presence. And if he walks away a second time, you may consider it an invitation to follow. Common mistake number six. Crating, gating, or kenneling dogs face-to-face -face with their triggers. A dog's trigger can be another dog, the neighborhood kids, your beloved mailman, or any number of things, especially if the trigger has unlimited movement and your dog doesn't. This is another one of those face-to-face -face versus side-by-side -side things, and that's what makes it significant. Positioning a side-by-side -side species like dogs across from anything of interest, for example, another dog, is akin to putting them on opposite teams. Think members of opposing football lineups versus friends and jogging partners. Because the dogs can't move around each other physically and socially, and because they're unable to stick their noses into all the important places, anxiety, aggravation, and even outright aggression can ensue. This is another topic that is covered a lot in the book, Smile. For now, if you've got a reactive or unsettled dog, know that leaving him face-to-face -face with the world behind underground or see-through fencing like chain link, left in kennels, or tied up for long periods of time can create a real me versus the rest of the world mentality. To prevent problems from occurring, invest in privacy fencing wherever your property faces public land or byways. It's worth every penny and peace of mind, and it will increase both your quality of life and that of your dogs. If privacy fencing isn't an option, or even if it is, drain your dog's energy reserves with well-paced walking or jogging. Tired dogs have less fuel to burn through reactive behavior, and they're more fulfilled psychologically, which sets them up to be happier pups and better family members. Now, this isn't a picture of a dog behind a baby gate in a house, but for all intents and purposes, it could be. Go ahead and use baby gates to keep dogs out of places that you don't want them to be, but don't use them to separate multiple dogs in your household. If you do that, you're setting your dogs up to be on separate and opposing teams with separate territories, something that can go badly for everyone involved. If you have dogs that you can't trust together when you're not around, house them separately, for sure. I'm not saying that all dogs should be together unsupervised, but don't leave them crated, kenneled, or gated in ways that leave them face to face, unable to move around each other naturally. Watch my video on introducing dogs to one another to learn how to get your dogs on the same team. The more you follow its recommendations so you can walk your dogs together, the faster you will bring peace into their lives and harmony into your home. Common mistake number seven is not addressing the energy of certain visitors before it incites concern in your dogs. The video I just mentioned is as good for introducing people to your dogs as it is for introducing dogs to each other. Your visitors will then compliment your dogs for their relaxed nature never knowing that it occurred because you corrected their behavior first. Common mistake number eight is another one that reflects a difference between human nature and canine nature, and it harkens back to golden rule number one and golden rule number two from the first video. Remember them? Golden rule number one is reward what you want. This means rewarding the energy levels, states of mind, and behaviors you want so you can get more of them. Golden rule number two is stop rewarding what you don't want. Again, something that applies to energy levels, states of mind, and behaviors alike. A common way that people break golden rule number two is also human, and it actually occurs because we're caring individuals at heart. Nonetheless, it flies in the face of canine nature, and it can trip dogs up on their way to becoming confident, relaxed individuals. It is when we touch and fuss over dogs when they are nervous, scared, 
or for that matter, aggravated. While it is also human and caring to talk to and touch a person who is feeling unease, with dogs, it is better to get them moving, so they move on quickly to a more relaxed state of mind. At that point, we can reward them for the right state of mind. Watch any good mama dog, and you'll see that that's what she does with concerned pups. She doesn't fuss over them. She doesn't vocalize a lot. She's more apt to give them a nudge or a lick to get them moving or get moving herself to lead them to a better frame of mind. There is so much we can learn from our dogs, and one of the things I appreciate the most is how readily dogs get moving to move on to better things, both physically and psychologically. On to common mistake number nine. Not rewarding calmness with a smile, so being calm is a choice your dogs make more often. This is where golden rule number one is important. The more we don't take for granted moments when our dogs choose to be calm, companionable, and relaxed, and the more we reward the same with well-timed, genuine smiles, the more we tell our dogs that we love when they are calm, companionable, and relaxed. Reward what you want, right? Definitely, and reward it in a way that promotes more of the same, something smiles do quite well in this instance. Common mistake number 10, not leading the way. Or in other words, not stepping up to make decisions at times when your dogs may not make the best of decisions. In this case, know that it is a lot less stressful for a dog to be the follower of a good decision maker than for him to be the decision maker himself. How to get back to making important decisions so your dog follows your lead is something well beyond the limits of any video. Nevertheless, three simple points are worthy of note. First. 95% of your dog's training requires training you. The good news is, if you consider yourself trainable, you may be surprised at how quickly and positively your dogs respond to your new skills. Second, the best training results will always come from good communication, thoughtful household routines that let your dogs know what is expected and encourage them to shine, a smart sense of timing, something that only gets better with practice, and an ongoing appreciation of the many lessons our dogs have to teach us, if we are open to the possibilities. And third, the best communication is rooted in the five C's. It is calm, clear, consistent, confident, and canine intuitive. Okay, just two more common mistakes worth mentioning. Common mistake number 11 is not recognizing the influence of hormones on a dog's behavior. And by this, I mean any canine hormones, male or female. Well, especially female. If you've got four dogs and three are neutered, but one is intact, your house has hormones and every dog in the household, heck, every dog in the neighborhood knows it. And hormones will dictate a certain percentage of the behavior that you'll see. Since it is rare that this effect is negligible, if you are having behavioral issues with your dogs, never overlook the influence of hormones. Ever live with teenagers? Well, dogs are worse because they don't grow into theirs. The last common mistake is overfueling your adult dog. Food fuels behavior, and from the standpoint of behavior, an adult dog's food gets converted into three things energy, fat, and poop. So here's a question for you Do you and the dogs in your household really need more of these things? If you have a fit working dog who's in peak condition or a new rescue who still needs a few pounds, you're not making this mistake. But if you have a hyperactive, anxious, or destructive dog, it's worth asking yourself if you are. Every couple of weeks, view your dog's waistline from above and from the side. If he falls into the overweight category and you're having behavioral issues, no matter what else is responsible for his behavior, your overfeeding isn't helping the situation. You can cut the volume back by 30 to 50 percent. But if that is easier said than done for you, you can try the string bean diet. Simply replace 30 to 50 percent of the dog food that you feed with string beans or peas, any variety, as long as they're unsalted. Equal volume, more fiber, fewer calories. Do some of these common mistakes sound familiar? If so, you've got lots of company. In your dogs, you also have some excellent teachers, even when the going gets rough. Allow yourself to learn from them, moment by moment. And if you mess up one moment, simply learn from it 
and aim to do things better next time. Chances are good your dogs will forgive you. And when you're up against the worst, try not to define a dog by his mistakes. Know that those mistakes are simply part of his learning curve and be willing to move on so he can too. I hope I've gotten you interested in learning more about your dogs. To learn more, check out this book from our shelter. It goes well beyond the material in our videos to help dog lovers prevent issues from occurring and to address them in positive and practical ways when they come up. You can read its first two chapters, table of contents, and excerpts from all 32 chapters at givesmiles.us, the website of Safe Harbor Farm Canine's Smile Project, which puts all proceeds towards animal rescue and canine education projects. Thanks!